Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our talks with Walt as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We turn now to a very interesting little poem that will sit right before the Sea Drift 11 set of poems called Broadway Pageant. This is, uh, a, a, again, kind of almost like an interlude song uh, between Birds of Passage and Sea Drift. Now, our assumptions are that you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net, down that left-hand side, Talks with Walt. And you've been working with us ever since the very opening lines of the deathbed edition of Leaves of Grass, all the way up through and including all of the poems of Birds of Passage. Now, as we like to, we'll turn to our Nortons quickly, and Nortons will tell us this poem was first printed in the New York Times, June 27, 1860, under the title, The Errand Bearers, end quote in commemoration of the parade down Broadway 11 days before of the Japanese embassy, which had come to America to work on treaty arrangements between America and Japan. So all kinds of interesting history about this poem by virtue of obviously the relationships between America and Japan. It would obviously be a few years later that the tragedy of Pearl Harbor would happen. Think about that. The title and the Quaker phrase in the subtitle, quote, 16th, 6th month, year 84 of the states, were changed when the poem appeared in the 1865 drum taps as a Broadway pageant, reception, Japanese embassy, June 16th, 1860, end quote. The drum taps text was uh, but slightly changed from the newspaper text, but in a slightly, uh, a significant revision of the opening lines was made for the 1871 and succeeding text. Omitted was the fourth line phrase, lesson giving princes, quote unquote. And in general, the emphasis was shifted from deference to the Orient to the role of America as the mistress of a new world democracy. And in this sense, Broadway pageant is a precursor of Passage to India, a poem that we will see and talk about later. Now, there's no question. Put it in your notes right away. Um, this is a poem that will be a companion read to, uh, to Passage to India. One of Whitman's great international poems, poems of the celebration of the world. I want to make the argument that in this poem, Whitman is going to intentionally move from being the poet of America to the poet of the world. Let's pay attention to the way that that happens. By the way, just to remind, the only other use up to this point of Broadway was in Song of Myself, Passage 33. You'll, uh, you'll, you'll remember this, uh, Shop Windows of Broadway. And uh, the word pageant will have been used in his poem, City of Orgies, that we've already covered. Now, notice this is a three-part poem, although we're going to take it all, all taken together, where in the first uh, section, he's going to emphasize specifically the Japanese em, em, um, embassy em, uh, that will arrive and go down Broadway and all of that. And by passage two and three, he'll begin to move away to celebrate the role of America in international affairs. And again, he's going to make this argument. We'll come back to our discussion of Hegel. He's going to make this argument that all of history has been moving towards the moment of America. He begins, over the Western Sea, notice capitalized, and um, uh, this, th n this idea of the West, and we've seen poems already of this game being played, over the Western Sea, hither from Nippon come, uh, Nippon is the Japanese phrase for Japan, courteous, the swart-cheeked, two-sworded envoys, uh, you'll remember this uh, swart uh, being used behind the swarthy face, right? Two sordid envoys, leaning back in their open um, barouches, bareheaded, impass impassive, rides today through uh, Manhattan. Now, just to, to make an observation, the mentioning of the two swords, we're going to see a lot of military language here. And it's going to be clear that Whitman's going to make the argument that America has learned from the great empires of the past the value of war and the value of peace, right? And then nine times this word libertad is going to get used, of course, Spanish for liberty. But here, it's a personification of freedom. And, in, and by the end, it almost seems as if he's talking not just about freedom and democracy, but about America itself, the embodiment, we might say, of freedom. I do not know whether others behold what I behold. Again, think about how so much of Leaves of Grass has been about what is seen, what is, beho what is beheld. In the procession along with the nobles of Nippon, the errand bearers, again, the, the original name here, br uh, bringing up the rear, hovering above, around, or in the ranks, marching. But I will sing you a song of what I behold, Libertad. Now, this word libertad, of course, in starting from Pomenach passage number three, uh, low uh, uh, victress on the peaks, also it will get used there. 
and then 15 times the word when. When million-footed, and by the way, notice the exaggeration of numbers to just show the mass. When million-footed Manhattan unpent descends to our pavements. When the thunder-cracking guns arouse me with the proud roar I love. This will be an interesting reference given, of course, what he feels and knows about uh, about war and about the Civil War and about the guns of war and of course drum taps we, we, we will soon get to, right? When the round mouth guns out of the smoke and smell I love, notice two times I love, spit their salutes. It's an interesting use of the word of the verb spit. When the fire flashing guns have finally as have fully alerted me and heaven clouds canopy my city with a delicate thin haze, by the way this my city taking us back to starting from Pominock Passage 1 when gorgeous the countless straight stems, we're back to growth themes, leaves of grass, right? The forest at their wharves, thicken with colors, when every ship, richly dressed, carries her flag at the peak, when pennants trail and street festoons hang from the windows, when Broadway is entirely given up to foot passengers and foot standers, when the mass is densest, when the facades of the houses are alive with people, when eyes gaze riveted tens of thousands at a time, and again, this numbers thing is fascinating, the way he's trying to build the majestic nature of America. When the guests from the islands advance, when the pageant moves forward visible, when the summons is made, when the answer that we did thousands of years answers, I, too, arising, answering, descend to the pavements, merge with the crowd, and gaze with them. And again, this idea of America is the answer to all of history. Um, the idea of Genesis we're going to get to now in the second, in the second part of this. When the answer that waited thousands of years, so we go from thousands of millions of people to thousands of years, these grow, these um, grow, kind of over, overblown numbers are all speaking directly to the spirit and the energy that Whitman wants to uh, give uh, in this poem. Notice I too, a phrase we're going to see several times here, and of course I too we've seen already several times. Passage 2. Superb faced, so notice first it's swart cheek, now it's superb faced Manhattan, so notice the shift. Also notice that we've got two exclamation points in a row. Comrade Americanos to us, then at last the Orient comes. And again, passage to India will be, we'll come back to this idea. To us, my city, and of course this use of the term my city, we're familiar with it, and we think of Sandberg's uh, Chicago as well, right? Where our tall topped marble and iron beauties range on opposite sides to walk in the space between. Today, our antipathies comes. So in other words, it's a way of reading geography and history. Everything about America for Whitman is a culmination. The exclusivity of America is that everything that happened in history was a product, ultimately, that would be America. And then he uses this term, the originatress uh, comes. The nest of languages, the bequeather of poems, the race of eld, um, that is to say, people of, of olden times. Um, in Passage to India, by the way, this word eld, the only other time it gets used um, in Passage to India, uh, number two. Florid with blood, pensive, wrapped with musing, hot with passion. Notice these words, sultry with perfume. It's almost like sexual language or amorous language is being utilized, but now he's of course talking about America and, and the fact that America is, is this amazing uh, product of history. With perfume, sultry with perfume, with ample and flowing garments, with sunburnt visage, with intense soul and glittering eyes, the race of Brahma comes. Now it's fascinating the way now, Whitman, uh, Emerson, of course, is in the same camp, right? These transcendentalists love to bounce back and forth between what we used to call the East and the West and the philosophies of the East and the West. It's kind of an arcane uh, idea, but there it is. And then he says it. See, my cantable, these, of course, uh, cantable, it really means flowing or song-like here. The melodious song is, is what is being referenced, obviously. Um, these and more are flashing to us, notice uh, already this word flashing, flashing to us from the procession, by the way this cantable, uh, proud music of the storm number two, uh, we'll, we'll find it there, as it moves, changing, a kaleidoscope, boy, and that's one, of those, that's one of those images that's central to our reading of Leaves of Grass, divine, it moves, changing before us, this idea of evolution and constant change. For not the envoys nor the tan Japanese from his island only, lithe and silent, the Hindu appears, the Asiatic continent itself appears, the past, the dead, the murky night morning of wonder and fable, inscrutable, this idea of the translinguistic nature of certain songs, right? The enveloped mysteries, the old, back to Eld, right? And unknown hive bees, the north, the sweltering south, 
Eastern Assyria, the Hebrews, the ancient of ancients, vast desolated cities, the gliding present. It's interesting the way he uses the word gliding. All of these and more are in the pageant procession. So now all of a sudden, we don't have a, a pageant on Broadway. We have the pageant of history and, of course, America itself. Why? Because Whitman is always about Genesis. That is to say, he's always about origins. Where did this amazing country come from? And in that regards, he puts himself right with Virgil, who has to write the Aeneid to prove where the great Roman Empire came from. I think Whitman knows exactly what he's doing. And then he says it. Geography, the world, is in it. The Great Sea, the brood of islands, Polynesia, the coast beyond, the coast you henceforth are facing, you, Libertad, using it again, from your western golden shores back to the opening lines, the countries there with their populations, the millions en masse, we've seen en masse used already in Leaves of Grass, are curiously here, the swarming marketplaces, and again, this idea that the world is just teeming with all of these amazing people, and again, I think... Whitman begins to want to be identified as the poet of the world. The swarming marketplaces, the temples with idols ranged along the sides or at the end. Bonsai, Brahmin, and Lama, of course, Bonsai, the Buddhist uh, Japanese monk. Uh, Brahmin, of course, is the priestly Hindu class, and the Lama, uh, the Tibetan priest, although the proper spelling is L-A-M-A. -A. Mandarin, farmer, merchant, mechanic, and fisherman, that's five that he lists. The singing girl and the dancing girl, the ecstatic persons, the secluded emperors, Confucius himself, the great poets and heroes, you might think of Lao Tzu here, the warriors, the castes, all trooping up, crowding from all directions, and then you get all these froms, from the Altai Mountains, of course that mountains uh, between China, Russia, Mongolia, and Kazakhstan, from Tibet, from the four winding and far-flowing rivers of China, and from the southern peninsulas and the, de and the demi continental islands, from Malaysia, these, and whatever belongs to them, palpable, Come, go back to Song of Myself, passage 16, to see his use of palpable. Show forth to me and are seized by me. Song of Myself, passage 34, with his use of the word seized. And I am seized by them and friendly held by them. It's always about the hug. I told you guys in Leaves of Grass. Till, as hear them all, I chant Libertad for themselves and for you. And then we're going to get nine, at least, of these eyes. For I, too, raising my voice, join the ranks of this pageant. I am the chanter, I chant aloud over the pageant. I chant the world on my western sea. Notice again, capitalized western. I chant copious the islands beyond, thick as stars in the sky. I chant the new empire, and then here's the shift. Grander than any before, as in a vision it comes to me. We'll get to sleepers, of course, when we do, uh, uh, very closely aligned a passage to India. I chant America. I told you guys, he doesn't use the name America very often in Leaves of Grass. When he does, I hear America singing, it's a big deal. I chant America, the mistress. Now, this idea of being the mistress and the lover uh, with Libertad, we'll see. I chant a greater supremacy. So here we go, the exclusivity of America. I chant projected a thousand blooming cities, again back to growth, leaves of grass, in time on those groups of sea islands, my sail ships and steamships threading the archipelagos, um, my stars and strike fluttering in the wind, we've seen this reference to the flag before, commerce opening, we're taking, thinking about money, the sleep of ages, the idea of waking up, having done its work, races reborn, refreshed, lives, works, resumed, the object I no, not, and again, notice the hyphen to make us think of our Emily Dickinson, but the old, again, we're back to eld, the Asiatic renewed as it must be, commencing from this day, surrounded by the world. Again, this I know not makes us think, of course, of the fallibilist position epistemologically and this idea of everything that we know has been pointing towards this moment in time. And, of course, now to, pa to part three. And he's going to embrace the idea that Hegel will embrace, that all of history is this progress towards the penultimate, for Whitman, obviously, America. And you, Libertad of the world, again, notice the exclamation point. You shall sit in the middle, well-poised thousands and thousands of years. We're back to this idea of just the large numbers. As today, from one side, the nobles of Asia come to you, as tomorrow, from the other side, the Queen of England sends her eldest son to you. Now, we know about this from our study of Year of Meteors, when Edward, Prince of Wales, later Edward VII in 1860, had his visit. The sign is reversing, and again, this will take us to our Hegel, right? The sign is reversing, the orb is enclosed, the ring is circled, the journey is 
done. We're going to get to traveling uh, here at the very end of the poem. The box lid is but perceptibly open. Nevertheless, the perfume pours copiously out of the whole box. Notice the genius here. He joins together both the Odyssey as well as Pandora, two Greek myths, as he plays this game. Young Libertad obviously speaking now about America, with the venerable Asia, the all-mother, back to mistress and mother, and children to come. Be considerate with her now, and ever hot libertad, for you are all. Bend your proud neck to the long-off mother now, sending messages over the archipelagos to you. Bend your proud neck low for once, young libertad. Bending the neck, bowing, reverence. In other words, here it is. As I've said many times, I think Whitman understands the idea of transcending and including, and yet there needs to be a reverence for the past. And then he'll play this game with word, right? This anaphoria of the, of the word word. Were the children straying westward? Notice he loves his rhetorical questions. Were the children straying westward so long, so wide the tramping? We have to think of open road, song of the open road, right? Were the preceding dim ages debouching westward from paradise? So long, and again, this debouching takes us back to starting from Pominach, passage two. Were the centuries steadily footing it that way, all the while unknown for you for reasons? This idea, uh, what do you think you, who do you think you are? Well, you're Americans, and because you're Americans, you, uh, every, everything that has ever happened in the history of the world is because of this very moment in time. It's remarkable. And then he uses the word justified. They are justified, that is to say redeemed, that is to say explained. They are justified, they are accomplished, they shall now be turned the other way also to travel toward you thence. They shall know also, they shall now also march obediently eastward for your sake, libertad. This idea of justified takes us back, of course, to Milton and his theodicy to justify the ways of God to men. I think Whitman is always about proper order, proper respect, and that takes us now to 2a to finish. All of history has been a marching towards what becomes for Whitman America. Not just the physical America, but the idea of America, of course. Then that is to say, the new transcends the old, and yet the new must respect the origins of the old, its value, that is to say. It to be, of course, the repetition. I love that Libertad gets repeated nine times. I love that he uses this win word 15 times. At 3A, we mentioned already passage to India. It's coming, especially section 5, for those of you that already want to jump there and start your study in anticipation of our getting there. Um, the, uh, the, the idea of reconciliation of the East and the West. Finally, at 3B, well, what do you think of America as this great culmination of history. Does that one make sense to you? Do you resonate with that idea? It seems to me that as now we live, of course, we look back and we can kind of see that Whitman was right there at the beginning of what was really going to become this amazing country, this amazing empire, America, and he could kind of see it. But Whitman, as a great artist, always does. Go back to some of my comments about the great poets, Shakespeare, of course, and Milton and Dante come to mind. They have this ability to look in three directions simultaneously. No question looking backwards, no question looking forwards, and yet they're always a product of their own moment. Well, now we are ready to turn to the 11 poems of Seadrift, and you should congratulate yourself on making it this far. Thank you.